Hello, hello everyone. Recording, check, okay, everything is working. How are you? How was lunch? Good? France never disappoints when it comes to, when it comes to food, right? <laughs> So I'm Andrea Verlicchi, I'm an Italian web developer dedicated to making the web a better place, more performant and uh, with a delightful user experience. But let me tell you about a story, a personal story about uh, me as a user. So I was buying groceries online a couple of weeks ago and I was in the product page and I clicked on add to cart. Nothing happened or and then I clicked add to cart again and then I had two jars of Nutella in my cart, which is not probably a bad idea. But that's one, what, not what I wanted to buy. So I had to go to the cart, adjust the number of the quantity of items in the cart, and that, make me, that made me lose time and cause frustration. And that could have led to abandon my cart, and which is not what we want, right? As a, Especially if you run an e-commerce, you don't want people to abandon your cart. Especially because, as Tammy told before, it's the last thing they will remember <laughs> of your store. <laughs> okay, so that's frustrating. And that made me realize that even small interaction delays can disrupt an otherwise smooth experience. Okay, since February, I've been auditing um, dozens, I guess, of websites <laughs> for IMP. And uh, today we'll explore how to identify and fix these delays, create smoother and more responsive experiences for our users. Let's see what a slow interaction looks like. This is inspired to something that I've, saw, I've seen before. So if you click and there is a delay of 700 milliseconds, that's not a good experience. Otherwise, if you click and everything happens quickly, the website feels snappy and your users will feel more, they will feel better, I'd say. So, what you learned today? Uh, how interactions are measured, how to debug slow interactions, both with and without real user monitoring data, what is the most common cause of IMP and other mistakes and how to avoid them. This is me again, Andre Verlicki. I've been working as a web developer for 25 years, I'm afraid. Yes, <laughs> and uh, most of my career in the front end part of the, the front end side, and uh, 10 years in e commerce web development, and now I am uh, more into web performance. And this is how it started. That's me. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize it was not full screen. Let me put it full screen. Oops, I didn't go to full screen. Maybe. That's full screen. Okay, that's me. Uh, when I started with uh, my adventure with web performance, it was at uh, um, a hackathon at Google HQ in London. And uh, 2019, I really loved it. And uh, then, since then, I started to specialize to, in web performance development even more. Today, I work at SpeedKit, which is the all-in-one paid speed top tool to accelerate your um, website and revenue. Those are some of our clients, uh, BMW, Decathlon, and Zwilling. And there are some stats and other logos that you can look in the recording, maybe later, not now. So the um, talk is divided into three parts. One is, what is the interaction to next paint? Second is debugging slow interactions. And third is identified mistakes and solutions. Let's start with the first one now, but first I want to ask you, have you heard of IMP before? By a show of hands, heard of it today for the first time? Yeah, four, four people, ten, five, five people out of, yeah, so it's like more or less 5%. <laughs> and uh, know the basic concepts of IMP, what it is more or less? Okay, then that's uh, 40%. And know exactly what it is and how it's measured. Yes, the other 40%. That's the audience I like. And anyone that didn't feel like raising the, their hands? They were sla lazy, distracted, sleepy. Okay, fantastic. Okay, so these are the web vitals. One is the low loading time, measured by the largest counterful paint. The other one is visual stability, measured by K 
cumulative layout shift and the new one introduced in March this year is measuring interactivity and it's called interaction to next paint. The good value for an interaction has to be bef below 200 milliseconds and uh, a bad value is considered to be above 500 milliseconds. And you might not know but these data are collected from Chrome, not from Google crawlers that search the web for, for information for Google search. They are collected from Chrome and sent to a large database of web performance called Chrome User Experience, aka Crux, that you can also consult using Chrome User Experience Report, which is one of the tools. This is showing you the advancement of IMP over time. It's still not good in this case, 475 milliseconds, but it's getting better over the months. And another way you can consult very, very easily uh, Crux is to uh, go to Page Spinning site, put the URL of your website, and you will see Interaction to Next Paint right there. And suppose this we have this website, Festa della Mama, that's beautiful. Uh, you want to uh, you want to do something <laughs> buy flowers so you click on select a date and this component is rendered right there was an interaction something was rendered and that, that took 150 milliseconds right there is another interaction I click on a date that component is disappearing another paint let's say 300 milliseconds then I Click on the occasion, open another component that takes 200 milliseconds to render, click on an occasion, close the component, 250 milliseconds, you know the deal now. And then I click on view selection, which will take me away from this page. And that's another paint after the click. So another 150 milliseconds, just to say, okay? So what is the IMP value for this page? The worst one. That is the 300 millisecond is the IMP for this page. So the home page of this Interflora country back in May had, for example, I'm just shooting out numbers now, 300 milliseconds. So to resume, IMP measures the first, uh, sorry, the time taken to update the screen after a user interaction. All user interaction within a page are considered, pointer event, click and tap events, and um, keyboard interactions. And the worst, the slowest interaction is reported as the interaction to next paint for the current page view. Okay, and this is the representation of how the main thread uh, looks like when the user is, is uh, giving you input. And this is according to web.dev. And the first part is input received, when the input is received. So when the input is received on the main thread, there was already some tasks happening. From the time the input is received to the moment in time the main thread has finished processing those tasks, that is the first subpart of the IMP and it's called input delay. The second part is when the browser is processing the event handlers attached to the, to the, in, to the element and the, the event that was fired. That's called processing time. And the third part is when the browser is rendering and layouting and painting pixels on the screen. That is called presentation delay. The IMP is the sum of all three. So the moment in time, from the moment in time, something was, the input is received and to the moment in time, the frame is presented. Now the second part, debugging slow interactions. Okay, show of hands now, especially you. That's a, a little game where we show our hands. Uh, never try to debug slow interaction, try to debug it, didn't find the issue, debugged and found the issue. Raise your hands if you're in the first group. Never tried, buried, didn't. <laughs> never tried to debug slow interactions, good. Thank you for your honesty, by the way. That's the 5% of before. Um, tried to debug it, but didn't find the issue. Yeah, be honest, come on. <laughs> okay, and 25, 30% debugged and find the issue. Wow, that's an audience, guys. That's, that's a very good audience. 
Thank you. That's a uh, 50 percent, I guess. I don't know if the sum gives 100, but <laughs> so debugging IP is uh, can be done in three steps. One is find out where the slowest interactions are occurring. Two, analyzing the causes of slow interaction, and three, solve it, <laughs> fix the problem. Right? Easy, right? Okay. And then uh, the find out where the slowest interaction are occurring can be done in two ways. One is manually troubleshooting the interactions and one is leveraging real user monitoring data. So, let's start from manually troubleshooting interactions. So this is the new web performance, uh, sorry, the new performance tab in Chrome 129. I tried to update it today, it's still on 128, but should be out in the near next days, I guess, or hours. Um, so if you go to the performance tab, now, in DevTools, you have these uh, three uh, largest counterful pane, cumulated layout shift, interaction to next pane, and you can go and open the record settings, uh, which is not only for recording, by the way, it's slowing down your CPU while you're interacting with the, with the website. So it's called recording setting, but it's not just for recording. So for, by the moment in time you slow down your CPU, it will slow, slow down everything. If, even if you're on a meeting, uh, with the Zoom or Google Meet, that will slow down your CPU. Okay, then uh, you click it on, I chose six times slow down uh, or 20 times slow down, depending on the computer you are working on. The, 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 the aim is to emulate the slow devices out there that are browsing your website. Usually your computer is fast. You're a developer, you have a fast computer, and you want to slow it down. So if you are on an older computer, just choose four times slow down if you want to emulate mobile or just don't slow down if it's a very old computer or otherwise it will die. And uh, then after you slow it down, you start interacting with the page and you will see component rendering, things closing, opening and stuff. And also don't forget to click on the search field and type there because also type uh, is considered an interaction, and close the, uh, the close the layer. Okay, in the end, we have interacted with the page, and we see here all of the interactions that have occurred while I was clicking around, and you will see the slowest one are ones are those two, 232 milliseconds on this CPU um, setting. One is icon in line, icon in line arrow alt button button bottom and the other one is span vc day content vc focusable just to say to read it because you cannot read it from here okay but <laughs> this is a manual process it takes multiple steps there is no guarantee that you will that you will find the slowest interaction which might be hidden some steps away and you need to repeat those steps for every page or page type. So, for example, in the home page, in the product listing page, in the product detail page, in the cart, checkout, etc. So, now we see how to do that using leveraging real user monitoring data. Real user monitoring is like this is your user browsing your website. And that is real user monitoring, the guy watching you. So that not watching your privacy, not violating your privacy, but still watching on user interactions and reporting that. Okay, and uh, so it's an ongoing monitoring of user's experience. And with that, you can do these beautiful dashboards with charts and stuff. And you can spot problems first. And you can verify fixes in just minutes or regressions, if you made regressions. Okay, so this is uh, not a chart, this is just a table, um, but I'm showing it now piece by piece. This is coming from our RAM data, um, from SpeedKit RAM data. We also collect RAM interactions and stuff. So the first two columns uh, tell us what are the uh, event and the element that was uh, clicked in that case. And so this is the interaction and tells us where is IMP occurring. The second part is tell how bad it is. It's telling us how bad it is because we have IMP on that page uh, when that was uh, the attribution was to that what was to that element. How many times it occurred over the, the selected time range? I think it was one day here. 
but if you do seven days, no, nothing changes in the order. The impact table, uh, the impact column, is just a multiplication of the other two, because sometimes you have, I don't know, something is occurring a lot of times, but the IMP value is small, so I want to uh, sort down by this column. For example, you see here 1.6 million is bigger because the IMP value is higher, even if it occurred less times. Then, where, which part should I investigate? Uh, you can see there, there is the input delay and the processing time and the presentation delay. And when the imp input delay is high, it means that you have to look not here, because we, when users clicked on that element, uh, there was something else going on in the browser in the, in the main thread. So you want to look at maybe in the ones that have a high processing time. And I'm digging now into this one, which is the uh, I don't remember, okay, Uptycon label, okay. Then the last part is where I can reproduce it as a developer. I can uh, go to mobile and to a certain uh, www uh, page, so I can open that in the browser and check. In fact, okay, that, that, that's just a quote, uh, run data has saved me countless hours when auditing core web vitals. And that's yours truly. <laughs> that's my quote. That's true. Okay, um, second is analyze the causes of slow interaction. Now we know what was the slow interaction, either because we found it manually or we found it using RAM data. And, for example, take a slow interaction like this one. This one is uh, just the span VC day content VC focusable. And how do we find that in the browser? We just copy the element selector go to the Elements tab in the browser and hit the, enter the search, the find, uh, the find uh, field and enter the, the element selector there. That will highlight the element in the DOM tree, which is that one. Uh, that span data, uh, V number, aria label, Lundy, Vonces, Vonces, Oat, the the yes, um, <laughs> uh, okay, um, but that's not visible. So uh, sometimes you have to search a little bit, but that's the that's one of those dates in the calendar uh, component. So what we do now, we go to the performance tab again, slow down the CPU again. This time I slowed it down by twenty times. This is a MacBook Pro M3, so it's very fast as compared to the average device out there. And this time we hit record because we want to trace what happens. And I usually wait a couple of seconds because the profiler needs to start up. Then I click on the element and stop the recording. And now uh, this flame chart will appear, which is something that we want to zoom in. So that's where the pointer interaction um, appeared. And you see the pointer interaction took, took uh, too much because it's highlighted in red. And we want to zoom in here, and if we zoom in, you will see that that function, which is called XE, because it's minified, is slow. It took 229 milliseconds, and it called run three times, and the first time it, the run function ran for 94 milliseconds, so it, it runs a lot. <laughs> and uh, to investigate on that, if you click on that in the flame chart below, in the summary, you will see there is a link to the file, to the function. And if you click on that, you will see the, you will find the function in the sources tab. What, you, what is going to do is to place your cursor here, and then I just selected it for you, for your convenience. Okay, now we know what is the slow interaction, and we want to solve it, right? Fixing the problem is not something that I can explain now easily because there might be issues in the uh, in input delay, in the processing time, in the presentation delay. You can find everything in web.dev, web.dev, very documented. But I want to show you the identified mistakes and solutions that I found while auditing IMP on our clients' websites. And now it's showtime again, hence showtime. Uh, never tried to improve IMP, tried to improve it, 
it didn't succeed yet, but didn't succeed yet, and successfully improved IMP. Let's see if the percentages are the same as before. Hands up for never tried improving. Now it's 10, 15 percent. Uh, tried to improve it, didn't succeed. Nobody. Okay, <laughs> five percent. Thank you for your honesty and successfully, successfully improved IMP. That's a forty percent. And somebody is being lazy, maybe, or I'm miscounting. Okay, so the identified mistakes are one: synchronously sending analytics beacons. And I say that again: synchronously sending analytics beacons. That's by far the most uh, frequent one. Inducing style recalculation and executing too much UI related JavaScript at once. Let's start from the first one. Synchronous lens <laughs> sending analytics speaker. This is by far the most common issue I discovered while auditing our clients. So, for example, here you see this fancy t shirt e commerce website. The size selected is M, which is too large for me because I'm thin. So I want to select the XS one. And XS, now when I click to the XS, this is a real use case, by the way, I'm faking the website, but this was really happening. After 1.1 seconds, what happened? The XS turned black. Now XS is selected. Took 1.1 seconds to do that. Why? Because in the, you see the pointer, oh, now it's calling, thank you. <laughs> this is a civil protection because there will be storms. So the pointer event um, is going on for 1.1 second. And the reason of that is there the, those problematic calls there. It's minified function called L. And I call it what the L function. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so that's problematic calls. And so what was happening there is most likely something like that. No, 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 um, it was something like that I investigated, but I'm making it pseudocode for you. So there is a select size handler, which is selecting a size and pushing data to tag managers. But that's a single task. And if you do like that, that will be executed everything synchronously in a single task. And the way you can solve that is to make the function async and await for yield to main, which is a function made like that. Returning scheduler.yield if it's in the browser, because it will be released in Chrome 129, but still not there, and this is only on Chrome. And the fallback to that is to return a new promise which resolves with a set timeout of zero. What it's going to do is yield into main thread, meaning giving back the control to the browser to process what's going on in the main thread and respond to user interactions. The only difference between scheduler.yield and set timeout is that scheduler.yield ensures you that if you are executing a set of tasks, if you yield in the middle of a set of tasks, the continuation will be uh, that the next function there, whilst the other one cannot assure that third-party codes will pu push some other high-priority tasks in the middle in the queue. And after I fix that in uh, the local browser using local overrides, you will see now that the interaction now takes only 100 milliseconds and the L functions are just called later in a non-blocking manner. So the the main thread has given uh, has gained control again. So always yield to the main thread before calling tracking functions or any other long-running tasks. Okay, functions, sorry. Okay, so if there is one thing that I want you to remember from this talk is this one. When I get back to work, I'll have to check how my website handles event tracking calls to analytic platforms. I'm going to say it in French too. À mon retour au travail, il me faudra vérifier les fonctionnements de mon site web concernant les appels de suivi de vos monde sur les plateformes d'analyse. How was that? Thanks. <laughs> okay. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it may be necessary for the developer to request access 
to the Google Tag Manager account and inspect the code there, I assume no responsibility for the shock that could cause to you. Okay. Okay, that's second thing, uh, um, inducing style recalculation. So that is another website I was auditing. <coughs> there is this install our app, it's the best on top. And when you click on the X button, after 250 milliseconds, which, which is a fairly high time, it was just disappearing and everything was shifting up. But why 250 milliseconds to just shift up the layout? It's not a big deal. What was happening? 250 milliseconds, most of them was executed in this presentation delay part. So the right whiskers of the pointer was this presentation delay. There is a lot of recalculate style there. Why? So after digging in the code a bit, we realized that the code, that the long recalculate style was triggered by um, uh, CSS custom properties, also known as custom CSS variables, sorry, being set on the body tag, like that. And that triggered the whole calculation. And I thought, maybe it's a Chrome bug. So we asked also Barry in the community and stuff, and uh, there is actually a Chrome bug filed. And they say, blah, 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 if you're adding a new custom properties, you defeat those optimizations that we previously made, and we have to go down the slow path. So this is expected. So how do we work around that? One way will be to use classes instead. If we can, we can use classes instead of custom properties in the, in the main body, right? In the body tag. So the class will be, I don't know, app header visible, app header shown, or something like that. But that's not always possible as a replacement for CSS custom properties because maybe the custom properties values were continuously computed via JavaScript depending on multiple factors, scroll, or something. Okay, so this solution is one of the options, but not the definitive workaround. If the custom properties are used in uh, CSS at a lower level, so not in the body, then assign custom properties to lower levels of the DOM, not to the body element. For example, in the header, if you need it there, or in the main, if you need to calculate things based on the header height. Or, or in both, if you need it in both. Okay, that's a simplification, right? But you get the, you get to, so just assign it close to where you need them. And when the custom properties are used in CSS at a high level, but you don't need, a, you, you don't need them in the lower levels, then avoid inheritance to the custom properties. If you, you can do that by JavaScript, by registering a property, CSS.register property, with the name up, up header height, and uh, you can say that's a length uh, as a syntax, a CSS length, meaning uh, pixels, W with something. Um, inherit false, that makes the trick. That says this property is set in the body, but it won't propagate down in the DOM. And then also, whilst you are in JavaScript, you can also assign initial value to it, 223 pixels. You do the same for the other properties, because they are two properties there, and you're done. That will not propagate down. And the last thing is, ask ourselves, is this really needed? Do we really need the style, the, uh, the custom properties there in the body? Because as developers, we don't ask ourselves this question enough. Is this really needed? Should I remove it? Yeah, because that was exactly the case in our clients. Uh, I tried to remove the assignment of the CSS property, the body tag, and everything was working as before. I tried corner cases, I tried different pages, everything was working as before. So I told the client just to get rid of it. And that made the website much faster. And uh, you see now the interaction took only 110 milliseconds. And the presentation delay is now completely gone. That was just the assignment of the CSS property to the body. So set custom properties close to where you need them, if you need them. And 
disable their inheritance if it's not required to be inherited from the children in the DOM. Third thing is executing too much UI-related JavaScript at once. But first, are you still with me? Sleepy? OK, fantastic. <laughs> After lunch, is, I know it's hard. Um, so too much UI-related JavaScript at once. What does it mean? This was the page while it was loading, the website was loading, it was shown like that. And after two full seconds, which is counting, gone, <laughs> it's a long time, it was just displayed like that. What was happening? Uh, <laughs> that. It's a animation frame fired, function call, anonymous, init slick, tfn slick, ie init. What was happening for seven times in a row, in an animation frame, we, they were, the developer said maybe, uh, let's select all the slick sliders and dot init, which is something very common to do in jQuery, but that's initializing seven slow sliders in a row that caused the delay of two seconds. So first of all, it's not a good idea to use an animation frame to schedule long tasks, because I will show you in a second. And second, maybe we don't need it to initialize all seven sliders in a row, because only some of them in the top were visible. So let me use some frames from Jake Archibald's talk. <laughs> I saw you. I saw it in your slides before. In this talk, which I recommend you to watch, Jake depicts the event, the event loop, which is that circle, and uh, the cursor there is, is spinning around in circles like that. When there are new tasks to be executed, this gate opens and the cursor will go there and execute the tasks. Well, those are regular browser tasks. Then it will return to the circle of boredom, and on, uh, 60 times per second, if you are on a 60 hertz display, it will open that other gate and go executing the rendering path, which is style, layout, and paint. Um, but if you schedule some task using a request animation frame, your code will be executed at this point, so before rendering anything. So if you place there an infinite loop or any, anything very long to run, you block the rendering and nothing is displayed ever more in the browser. So you're blocking, you're blocking. So um, don't use a request animation frame for scheduling non-animation work. That's very useful if you want to do something which is related to animations. That's why it's called request animation frames, right? And for scheduling non-animation work. And returning to this issue, we are initializing seven sliders. So even if we didn't use re uh, request animation frame, that will be that would have been a very long task anyway. Uh, so maybe it's not a good idea to... The mantra of optimizing IMP is to execute less JavaScript and execute it only when you need to execute it. So maybe initialize only the sliders that are relevant and yield to the main thread from time to time. So here's the code you can use to initialize uh, sliders only when it's needed. First, request all the sliders, uh, query all the sliders in the page, then initialize the slider with a function, which is being revealed in a second, then use an intersection observer to, I say interaction a lot, <laughs> intersection observer to check if something is in the visible portion of the DOM, of the, sorry, of the viewport, so in the viewport, and uh, for each of the sliders we selected above, then observe it. What will happen? Initialize slider is if slider is a thing and uh, it doesn't contain the class slider initialized. I will yield to I would yield to main here for just for just uh, being yielded to so <laughs> give control back to the main thread and initialize and uh, initialize a new slider. I use swiper here because it's uh, not depending on jQuery, so it's faster, it's more modern, and add the class slider initialized, so the browser knows that that's already been de dealt with. The new intersection observer thing is just looping through the entries which are passed here, and uh, if checking if is intersecting, and initialize the slider if it's intersecting. Then, 
I'm observing it, so I don't need to observe it anymore with this observer. Forget it, it was initialized and catch eventual errors with console error or whatever you want to do to track errors. That clear? Okay, but as I told you before, we don't ask ourselves this question enough. Do we really need JavaScript to make our sliders? Because if that's just some content scrolling <laughs> horizontally and we just need to be snappy at the center, we could probably use scroll snap type in CSS, which is only using CSS to do that. Okay, that's showing a scroll bar. Who said the scroll bar is bad? I mean, that's not really bad for me. It's, it's good to see, but if you want the dots, you can also use CSS to detect what is in the viewport and visualize the dots. So if you don't need fancy infinite loop things, if you don't need tracking or <laughs> anything related to JavaScript, you just can use CSS to make a slider. That's probably better. So run only the JavaScript code that is currently needed and delay everything else. The conclusion to this talk is things to remember. Yield to the main thread before calling tracking functions. If using custom properties, CSS properties or CSS available variables, set them close to where you need them. Check if you're using a request animation frame for non-animation work and use it only for scheduling animation related work and delay all the JavaScript code that is not currently actually needed. Give you some time for the pictures, thank you. And that's it. Uh, whilst I am here answering your questions, I was fast, right? Um, I ask you kindly to use this QR code to give me feedback on this talk. I know it's after lunch, your arms are heavy, but it's a minute, one minute, just a voting, and if you want to say something, you can, but you don't have to. Thanks. Do we have any questions? Thank you. Uh, imagining a scenario where we have like an input and we have like a, to search, a function to search address on it attached and there is a drop down showing the addresses. Uh, how is the INP report going to be for because there will be an api call on each like enter of the user so i guess the inp not going to show like the entire time for the api call to when like the mod the drop down is shown how is it i always get this question because it was the same question that i asked when um when they presented inp at perf now two years ago i was thinking that showing something right away uh, to the user will be important. For example, uh, I had in mind in an e-commerce website when you select the size of, um, sorry, the color of a t-shirt, that will change the image, the main image of the product usually, right? And in my mind that was the IMP, right? So maybe showing a low resolution version of the image was uh, improving the IMP, right? No, that's not because it's um, the, the, the thing that uh, it was also hard for me to understand is that asynchronous operations are not uh, counted as next paint. So the next paint in the case of the writing something in the input field would be just a character appearing on the, on the input, not something that is rendered after the asynchronous call. So you have to be really, um, to look into what's, um, what, what's going on in the input. And because sometimes if you are running a lot of code to do the uh, computation um, to, to select stuff, uh, to retrieve the values, that could be uh, a, long, a long function, a long, a long task. So you have to go to the developer tools, open and see. And if it's slow, the interaction, that it means that it's, you're running synchronous code, not the fetch operation, but the synchronous code in the main thread that is slowing down uh, the the CPU and the main thread. Cool, thank you. Just 
one more question. Uh, do you think uh, it can be the NP report could be like bigger if the the function frame takes too much time to be pushed to the call stack or no? What do you mean by a function frame? I mean when the user uh, press a key then there will be a function attached to the event done on change. And then if this function uh, takes too much time to go to the call stack, is it going to be like reported by the NP or some or yeah, the that's, report? That's the case, yes. Okay. So you have to yield to the main thread before executing that long running code. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when the results come back, come back, you can update the UI and that's, that's it. Amazing, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, any other question? Elle peut être en français et je peux être traducteur aussi. Yes, uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, for the yield, uh, it will be uh, available for other uh, browsers uh, also? At the moment, I don't think so. But you never know. <laughs> I don't do work for neither for Firefox or um, yeah, no Mozilla nor, nor Apple, and I don't know. I know Google uh, is releasing it, but Barry here has the answer to this question. Maybe just raise the finger. Um, hopefully. Um, so we would put it through the standardization process. We've asked for feedback. We've got positive signals from um, the tag group, which consists of all browsers, um, including Martin, who works in Firefox. Firefox implemented the post task, which was kind of the first version of that. Um, I think it's still behind a flag, but they have it. And schedule.yield builds on that, and it's just a nicer, easier way. It's one line rather than having to wrap things up in the thing. So I, I would, without wanting to speak for them, um, I would suspect that Firefox will, um, Safari is always a, an unknown. They don't tell you, which could mean they're very interested or they will never implement it. Um, but we're hopeful, and I think the best thing you can do for that is ask for it, because um, we can tell other browsers how to do their job for them. It doesn't come across the best, whereas if developers ask for things, then then they get a lot of it. So um, Jen Simmons from the Safari team reaches out a lot and asks for what developers want. So if you follow her on social media, you can suggest these things. Um, but obviously, try it out first and make sure it works. We're very happy with it, so hopefully it will. Maybe it will be on Firefox. And we don't know about Apple, but ask. Yeah, also on Microsoft Edge, which is quite used, I guess, uh, on Windows computers. Yeah. Other questions? Then. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will stop the recording.